Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of class. The title of this class will be called The Life of a Gare. All right. We have a bit of bad news to report, but it depends on how you look at it, I guess. This class is dedicated to a, a personal friend, uh, a life friend, a uh, type of brother, uh, maybe some of you have heard me discuss this character a little bit, but today we're going to really give a discourse to the the life and influence and bracha and mazel and success of Svat's dear friend, Ron Van Arsdale. Okay. It's going to be a memoir of Ron and it is the, as the class continues, it will begin to make sense. This book, many of you know by now, is The World of the Gear. Authored by yours truly and Chaim Klorfin. In the acknowledgments, we acknowledge and we are grateful to all our friends and associates who also helped make this project a reality. And amongst the names listed is Ron Van Arsdale. And from this point, I'm going to close the book, actually. I'm going to keep it open. And I'm going to introduce everybody to the gear, inspiration, and beginnings of this project, Ron Van Arsdale. This is not going to be a regular class of scripture and sources, and I'm going to sit back, actually, feeling literally, and I'm going to give over uh, the life of Ron as I know him, or knew him. The dates are going to be, you know, not so accurate. I don't remember exactly what I'm about to say, so take it with a grain of salt, but uh, the story will have its moments of clarity. I got this thought... In 2001, I was a young bucker, a student in yeshiva, and my life of Torah began. Old city of Sfat, yeshiva Shalom Rav, and I had an interest of the nations. I got interested in teaching in Torah and learning on chat software called Talk City. And there were spiritual chat rooms back then. Back when chatting used to be good and interesting. I've been chatting since the mid-90s. Where I come from, Dayton, Ohio, there was, there was a great online community before there ever was internet online communities in the world. And as I got this new, this new software, it was part of your TV, your console, you could chat. And I went into this... I guess interfaith, open chat, whatever it was. And I was I was just learning about Judaism for the first time. I mean, at, at this stage of an adult, you know, past my bar mitzvah and things and getting serious with life. I met a woman who was in her 50s at that time. She was a nurse from Dallas, Texas, and her handle was Ruby Wings. My name, I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> They just went by my email address. And I didn't know if she was kosher. Now, looking back, I know exactly what she was. She was a Noahide, and she was teaching Noahide Torah. But, you know, this is back in the late 90s. I didn't know what a Noahide was. I barely knew what a Jew was. All I know is there was a, a non-Jewish woman who learned the Humash, <laughs> And she was interested in talking to this Jewish kid in, in, in Tampa, Florida, and in Cleveland, Ohio. I moved in the middle. And I, I remember, I, look, I, I was so raw. I don't know if I had any conception of what kosher even meant. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, again, very raw terms. But is this woman okay? You know, I, I, didn't, I, I did not even know enough to say is it a chashash and whatever, you know, suspect. But whatever mind I had, I remember thinking on some level, was she all right? I, I remember I decided, yeah, I think she's okay. I didn't hear anything about Jesus, and I figured that, that works for me. We got to talking, 
And I started getting heavy into my Torah lessons in Cleveland. And again, I just I, I grew up around non-Jews. My friends were non-Jews. And I always had the, the non-Jew in mind. For the sake of being a light to nations, before I knew what being a light to nations was, it just, as I got spiritual, I don't know, I guess I understood that that, that was my calling. Um, I didn't go out to be anything. It just, I think it was a natural rule. For example, this Ruby Wings, why is she talking to me? I'm just some young kid in the chat room. I certainly didn't have anything to offer. Uh, I felt I had potential, but, you know, God sent, again, I didn't know who these people were, but God sent Garam in my life. And how do I know it? Because I'm still friends with these Garam today. Uh, so, you know, my good friend Lisa in Cleveland today is a Gare, been my friend for 20 years. My high school friend, Nick Talley, came to the Anita Jones conference, right? So when I was young, I didn't know what it was. I just kind of knew without, without being able to articulate what it was. Now I can articulate. But at that time, it was between, you know, innocence of youth and starting my religious journey. Long story short, Ruby Wings told me three things in one particular conversation. She said that her favorite book of this thing that there's a scripture called the Tanakh. I didn't know what that was. I, I knew the five books. I had this same book here, the Art Scrolls Stone Chomish, but I didn't know what Tanakh was. But she said, there's something called Song of Songs. You might want to check it out. I said, that's pretty amazing. Really? There's a Scripture called Song of Songs? I'd like to check that out. Then she said her favorite Parsha was Parsha's bow. I, I, I didn't know what that was all about. And she said, have I ever heard of Malkin Sedek? I said, wow, wait, hey, who's that? I, I, don't, I think I, by that time I'd been through the Chumash maybe once. Really rudimentary uh, learning of the Parshiot. So I, again, Art Scroll Chumash, whatever's in the Art Scroll Commentary... That was what my, my learning was. I knew there was a Ramban, there was a Rambam. I thought they were the same guy with a typo. So, you know, all I know is I never heard of a Malkit Tzedek. And it must have been I knew of Shem. Because when she said Malkit Tzedek is the son of, Noah, son of Noah Shem, somehow I remember that clicking like, wow, really? So I, I must have known who Shem was. And again, probably because I... I I focused on the first two partial because after you get into uh, the middle of Bereshis, you start to lose focus in your fervor of a bal tshuva because it's it's a big book. You know, it's very easy to learn the first two partial. Long story short, she tells me Shem ben Noach is Malkit Sedek. and she urges me to open my chumash and look at Art Scroll, and they will tell me they'll confirm. This is partly why I know she was kosher because anybody else who was Christian would have said it was Yeshu. She's referring to the art scroll Chumash. So, you know, looking back 20 years later, I can say, yeah, this was a Noahide woman. But she was right. The son of Noah, Shem, he was called Malki Tzedek, and they bring the, the proofs, you know, that the hints and the letters, the initial letters, the Melech Shalem spells Shem. And that was good enough for me. So I went to Yeshiva not long after. She was telling me to, you know, you're going to go to Yeshiva and make Aliyah. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. But in the end, it was, it was true. She was right. I got to Yeshiva, and every bald shuv in the world has probably been blown away by Rabbi Yitzchak Ginsburg's secret of the Hebrew alphabet. I mean, it was in English. It's profound. It's deep. I still use it to this day. And I remember looking through it, not understanding a word. And it got to, the, I think, the letter Tzaddik, if I'm not mistaken. And it mentions you know, about, about Mashiach, which is not a surprise, being that it's a Chabad book, right? They're all about Mashiach. And he says that there's the, there's the Mashiach and this character called the Kohen Sedek, the spiritual companion of the Messiah. And this is where we get the common last name Katz. And I'm saying, yeah, all right, go Team Katz. For obvious reasons. I called Rabbi Ginsburg to ask him, what is this Katz? Who is the Kohen Sedek? And he said, to look in the book of Malachi chapter 2, all right, the lips of the Kohen will safeguard knowledge. And I looked it up. Uh, you and I just looked it up very recently, very much more in depth than it was 15 years ago. 
And it's a very profound teaching. My, my understanding of it has changed over the years, obviously. Um, today, I have a whole teaching about it based on the, the blessing of Moshe Rabbeinu to the tribe of Levi. That's beside the point. And in the footnotes of, of Rabbi Ginsburg, by the way, for the side note, the footnote to this class, the, defi the, 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 the definition Rav Ginsburg gave, the com spiritual companion to the Messiah, I always wonder where he got that from. I never found it again. Until recently I saw an obscure midrash brought by Louis Ginsburg, the legend of the Jews. He quotes the exact nusach of that midrash that they says Eliyahu is the Cohen Sedek spiritual companion of the Messiah. So I finally did find out where Rav Ginsburg got that from. But in the footnotes, he he quotes Tractate Sukkah 52b. And I remember being a young guy in yeshiva not long after I got there. And I had asked everybody in the base medrash, can you help me learn this Gemara Sukkah? Is, you know, I, I couldn't read for anything. I remember I asked all these guys, and, and some people tried, and I don't even know why it was so hard for them to find it. It's not that hard to find nowadays, but a couple of guys looked at me and they said, what do you want to learn this for? I said, I don't know. I'm just, I'm compelled. I want to know who this Cohen Zedek is. So finally, I got someone to sit down with me. And Rashi answers the question, who is this Cohen Zedek? Now, uh, two guys actually answered the question in, in the yeshiva. One was Rabbi De David Klein, Rabbi David Klein told me that the Kohen Sedek is mentioned in the Harachaman Brachas, the last bracha of Birkas Amazon. Did you know that? It says Mashiach in the second to last one, and then the last one is like, bring us the Kohen Sedek, which is Eliyahu. That's one answer. The other answer is Rashi Sukkah 52b of the four craftsmen of redemption, Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef, Eliyahu, and the Kohen Sedek. Rashi says it's Shem ben Noach. I'm saying, wow. How is it possible that in the redemption with you know, Mashiach ben David, and by the way, this is the only place in the entire Shas where Yish Mashiach ben Yosef is mentioned by name. Also told over to me by Rabbi David Klein. So it's a very peculiar Gemara. And I, I chewed on it for a long time. Why is a non-Jew tied up with Mashiach and Gula? Hard question to swallow. That's why everyone said, what do you want to learn this for? It's so not Jewish. I'm saying, what do you mean it's not Jewish? It's the, it's the Talmud. It's Sukkah, 52b. So now it's, I got this complex now. We got Ruby Wings telling me about this Malki Tzedek. You got Sukkah. And then, shortly afterwards, I used to, on Bain Azmanim, I would hang out in the Chabad English Library. And they had an excerpts from the Zohar Chadash in English. Back then, remember, I couldn't, I couldn't really learn Hebrew. And in Parshish Lech Lecha, it talked about Shem and Avraham, Malkit Sedek. Now, the, the word in the street is that Shem lost the kahuna to Avraham for blessing him wrong. The Zohar Chadash said that Shem did it on purpose in order to give the kahuna with a blessing to Abraham. So what did I do? I went out and I bought that, that Zohar Chadash in English from Chabad. Still have it on my bookshelf here. So anybody that ever told me ever again, Shem messed up, he was the kid of Noah that sinned and lost the kahuna, I always had the Zohar Chadash to say, hey, 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 not true. And it always goes back to Sukkah, Rav Ginsburg, and Ruby Wings telling me this, this amazing Kiddush about Shem, Malki Tzedek. Then you find out in Tehillim 110, Malki Tzedek's bracha, Right, And that's a whole discussion. And you find out the church perverted Malkit Sedek. That's a whole discussion. 
Then you find out the Ramchal says in uh, his uh, his parish on the Tanakh that the anointment of Mashiach is the wisdom of Malki Tzedek. Then you find all these gems throughout Shas and the Talmud and Nister and Magi Mesharim and the Arizal. Everybody's talking about how great Shem Malki Tzedek was. In fact, when you when you look deep enough, you realize nobody ever said contrary to this. Nobody ever said that Shem was actually something other than great. It was just that once you 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 translate it into English and butcher it well enough, you'll come across with a very bad teaching. Like in Parshas Ray, you give your trafe meat to the gear and you translate that as convert. Right? Eventually, you make a grotesque error. Shem Malki Tzedek is the subject of those types of errors. No qualified rabbi in history ever spoke poorly of Shem. Only a modern fad of poorly translated tractate Nadarim has done such an injustice to Shem. After 15 years, I had a plethora of Torah of Shem that I wanted to teach, or could teach. Right outside this window, downstairs, is the cave. What do you call that? The um, eponymous, right? Eponymous Shem and Aver Cave. Original yeshiva where y Jacob learned Torah. And I, lived, I live now just outside the cave, but it used to be I lived just down the street. Literally a 10 second walk. And I got married and had kids. And I left Kolel to be a, this light to nations. I was teaching English in a Muslim village. And since I wasn't in yeshiva, after having been there for a decade, I wanted to learn in this this this, this synagogue downstairs, the, the synagogue of Shem and Aver. And they had a night Kolel. So I went to bed at around 8 o'clock at night, woke up around 2. And I used to go into the cave and learn in the night Kolel Kabbalah and Torah with the chevra, it used to be a nice chevra over there. And on Shabbos, they opened the cave and made Kiddush, and I used to make uh, Dvar Torahs over there. And I was always having Shem in mind, because obviously it was the cave of Shem and Aver. So not many people have understood the Torah of Shem, or were interested in the Torah of Shem. And I had really no interest in the nations as, as a thing. I was just open to non-Jews, and I always... You know, it would take like the teachings of Rav Hutner, Rav Yitzchak Hutner, who was a the te the rabbi of my Rosh Hashiva, Rav Weingott of Chaim Berlin, and Rav Hutner's very pro Seven Laws of Noah, and and that whole Universal Torah slant. I I didn't know how much it affected me, but it did, because I was a big fan of Rav Hutner. I was a big fan of my Rosh Hashiva, and I grew up, you know, as growing up, literally growing up in yeshiva. And then experiences like Ruby Wings and, and Shem Ben Noach. That the non-Jew in Torah was something I felt in my heart and soul very strongly. Tragedy struck. My wife passed on. And I was alone raising two kids. And I had this neighbor who was a longtime friend, former mentor in the yeshiva. And he had like a, a yeshiva kind of complex. And he rented rooms sometimes to people. And there was a fellow renting a room who I'd seen around town. I know he was a non-Jew. I know he was good with the chevra, good with the community. We never really spoke because I wasn't so social. I mean, I was in Kolo and I went home to my wife and kids. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't really time to... To be, you know, get involved. By the time this guy came around, I was already deeply entrenched in Torah and, and marriage and kids and things. So I had this rent. There was a high rent. And there was a period where my kids were at their grandparents' house. While my wife took ill. And I didn't know what to do. It looked, things looked pretty, pretty grim on a personal level. And this guy, it was, it was summertime. His name was Ron Von Van Arsdale. And all I know at that time is he's a Gemini. He found out I'm a Gemini. I don't know how. I think I just had a birthday. And he, he, had, he had heard or found out. 
And he comes up to me. He says, hey, you're a Gemini, ain't you? I said, yeah, I'm a Gemini. He says, I'm a Gemini too. He says, hey, you, you see that? You see that? There's a big eclipse coming in the moon tonight. They say it's going to be uh, three days of darkness. I said, yeah? He says, yeah, let's go up on the roof and watch it. I said, okay, why not? So he and I became friends. He was living next door. Eventually he moved in. Helped the rent. We became friends. We got to talk in everyday Torah. He was from Goshen, Indiana. A former Mennonite. And he's telling me his story. You know, he was this and he was that. And then one night we're sitting on the patio. And he says, man, you know, I would always tell him about Shem. Shem was on my mind because the cave. Shem, 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 Shem. And he says, man, you know, those B'nai Noach, they would love your Torah. And I said, yeah, all five B'nai Noach. I'm sure they would love to hear what I have to say. He says, no, 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 there's a whole bunch of them. He says, I used to be one. I said, you're a Benny Noach? He says, yeah, I came on the charter mission. There was a 19, I don't, know, I don't know if he was part of 1990 or 98. He says, Chaim Richmond was a good friend of mine. He gave me this book personally. He used to always say that. He gave me this book personally. And he used to always say how he came on the charter to Jerusalem. They signed some kind of declaration. They put it in a safety deposit box. And he knew all these people. And I kind of know the names from today, some of them. But it's the old timers. Back from Vendel. He knew Vendel. And I'm like, Vendel Jones is really real? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's real, it's real, it's real. He said, your stuff's so right. I'm telling you, you shake that tree. It's all going to come down. I had nothing to lose. You know, I, I'm losing my family to, to, you know, to death and things. And I left Kolel to kind of pursue a personal dream of being closer to my wife and kids and Kind of just give be a light to the nations, teaching English in a Muslim village, kind of giving over, you know, a, a representation of Torah. That was my goal. So we we he moved in, like I said, and we had these talks, and I'm trying to just figure things out. You know, it's been a decade long, and I'm transitioning now. I don't know what's going to be tomorrow. And I I thought I was going to die too, just because it's like my chef is stopped, my life stopped. Very strange period of my life. It was a huge transition looking back, but you don't know that when you're in the fire. All I know is I just kept going to those kiddishes in the shoal and the cave and strengthening Shem for some reason. That's what was on my mind. Tor of Shem, Tor of Shem, Tor of Shem. And I told Ron, yeah, you know, Shem is great, but people think he sinned. And he said, why do they think that? I said, because they said, you know, he says, no way. I, I, we, we talked about it. One day he comes home and he says, he says, wow, that was heavy. I said, what's heavy? He says, I just came back from Shem. I said, yeah? He says, yeah, I went over to the cave. I went to apologize. I said, why'd you apologize? He says, I had to tell him that I'm, I'm sorry and I had to ask for forgiveness. Everyone calls him bad names, and he was dumb and silly, and he messed up. I said, I, after I know all this, I had to apologize. I told him I'm sorry. I said, wow, that's pretty heavy, Ron. So you better believe that night I went and I got my tukas over there, and I apologized too. I asked him for forgiveness too. I said, man, I'm sorry. Everyone's saying bad things. I'm sorry. So Ron got me thinking, and he kept he kept saying we have a bond because we're I'm a Gemini. That was his whole thing. If you are a Gemini, you are good with Ron, no matter what, no matter what. So one day Ron was coming home late, and I decided I'm going to type on the internet, I don't know something Noahide. And Noahide nations came up. Ray Patterson. I called him up. And I told Ron. I said, Ron, this guy in in, in Dallas wants me to teach. Uh, a Torah Shem class and write an article and do a radio spot. He says, there you go, guy. There you go. Now it's for you're ready. Your, your, your tour is going to come. I'm like, really? This is kind of weird, Ron. I don't know. So I didn't want to look stupid. So we made, me and Ray figured out what to do. And we're going to do a, a, a long series of Shem Torah. Ron was excited. Ron was loving it. 
He just, he saw the light. More than he could even articulate to me. I bought Onsar Chachma, 50,000 50, Sfarim on hard disk so that I would never run out of Shem Torah. I didn't want to look stupid. I did a search. I said, Ryan, check this out. Shem, son of Noah? Malkit said it comes up like 2,000 times. So I knew I had like 2,000 classes worth of material. Thank God. I won't look stupid. I just started printing out stuff, printing out stuff, printing out stuff. And every day, I would tell Ron, look at this. Did you know the white census is in the schus of Shem and the blue and Avram? What really got Ron was the one about Shem had his heel Noah and he made it up to the to Gan Eden by the by the power of understanding God's names. And he ate from the tree of life, lived forever, met Shlomo at Har Sinai, right? And uh and Shlomo said, Hey Shem, is that you? He says, Yeah. He says, What happened in the year 2448? He says the Torah was given. And then Shlomo, where well, they had this exchange, and Shlomo buried Shem. And Ron and I understood that that Shlomo definitely got the Torah Shem. And we couldn't prove it back then. I mean, now it's such a lie. Is, is it a question anymore? I mean, it's so illogical, right? You're Shem, the father of the Torah, Shem's there. Shlomo's there. Of course it's a Torah encounter. Just on a logical level, aside from the sources. But when I first realized that the Torah of Shem somehow related to Shlomo, mind-blowing. Just broke every klippa in the world. And Ron and I were on a high of Shem Torah that whole summer. We were telling everyone about Shem and did you know about Shem and the Torah Shem? And so the, the, the 34 classes, which are you can see them on YouTube, they were there. Ron had his own room. I had my room. We would now we were we were teaching in American hours in Israel. I would wait, wake Ron up every morning at 2 a.m. You know, Ron, get up! We gotta, we gotta prepare. Get up! He'd wake up, and get his coffee, come in all, you know, all bug-eyed. And what we would do is really iron out and smooth out all these Noahide concepts and ideas, right? And I didn't know what Ron was. If he's a Noahide a Jew, and he never said he was Jewish, but he used to be a Noahide. He had a bris mila. I didn't know what it was. But he was kosher, I know. Everyone accepted him. He was friends with the rabbis. Everyone just knew Ron was okay. And now I'm living with him. So it's like kind of strange. And we had, to, we had to work out these concepts. Like if the Jewish people are called the chosen people, what do we call the Noahide? Right? Are they the nice people, the special people? Whatever we were doing, we didn't want to be pompous and continue the pat on the head treatment. This is going to be epic. It had to be epic. Let's we got to make it epic. So Ron and I would work out like two guys like in a garage fixing up a Corvette, right? Figuring out what is this Noahide Torah? What is the Torah Shem? One class, two class, three classes every week. Wake up two or three in the morning. Ron, get up. We got to prepare. He'd come in with his coffee, he'd sit in the chair, watch the class. And we just had this momentum. We were building something. We were building something. However, six months, nine months, whatever it was, went by. My kids come back home. Ron was kind of a nomad. He's moved on by now. And he's living in different places in town. And we're still kind of checking in. By then, there were these... These guys that were interested in us getting a book. So Chaim, my good friend, he was also a very close friend of Ron. Ron did a lot of work for Chaim in the house. And we were going to write a book called The World of the Gear. Now Ron, in the beginning stages of Chaim writing the book, he and I would go over to Chaim's house for Shabbos night, Friday night. And just, we would, we would hit Chaim with all these different things and Trying to get him to see the Noahide Gear Torah point of view. I just started knowing Gear at that time. And if I remember, my memory serves me correctly, Ron, I told Ron he was a Gear. And he didn't say no, but it was like so new, I don't know. 
It didn't even matter at that point. Ron was just kind of in, so it wasn't such a, a shock. He wanted to marry a convert. So I drove him to the base in in Haifa. He was going to convert. Never did. Just There was two Balagan and procedures, and the girl didn't work out. He got a, he got a, a bris mila before I met him. And he told the guy that it was going to be, I guess, the shame conversion. What else would you say? Back then, there was no infrastructure to, to or precedent to base these things on. And he kept saying that there was something wrong with the mikvah. Now, I know what that means now, looking back. All right? And this is consistent with Ron and what he said in his life. He didn't have the right kavan and there weren't proper adim, witnesses, and intention of the mikvah. But from a Jewish point of view, they don't know that there's any other way it can be. So it's like, if you get a bris mila and you get in a mikvah, you're just Jewish. That's what people think. It turns out that's not exactly true. So Ron never properly took on Judaism. Never converted. And in the end of his life, we can say the guy, he was a Ger Toshev. Classic, classic case Ger Toshev. But for the whole creation of the book, Ron was heavily consulted. I mean, I live with him. And my nature is to really just kind of get in sync with people when I'm around them, especially for living conditions. I didn't know Ron was downloading to me this program, right? This GAR program. It's why he wasn't a regular Noahide, it's why he wasn't a regular GAR. That's why he wasn't a regular convert, a regular Jew. He was always giving over this just kind of, not a message, just a vibe. And everyone loved it in town. I got to see it up close. And you know, working on the Torah of Shaman, working on the gear, working on the Noahide. What is Texas and who are these people? Ron knew it. He was there. He lived it. What is the ancient wisdom? What is wisdom? So by the time the book was getting completed, Chaim would ask me, is, is Ron a, a Ger Toshav? I said, yeah, he's a classic Ger Toshav. It doesn't get more classic than Ron. That's what I told Chaim. And nobody wanted to ask Ron, because it's not like you know the kind of thing you say, hey, by the way, are you a Ger Toshav? I mean, just didn't ask him. But you know, I mean I lived with him and, and it was we spoke very intimately, and I know for a fact he didn't take on mitzvahs and Judaism and conversion, right? And he, he didn't he didn't know if he was a Jew or a Gair or Noahide, and he didn't want to know. He was just here. That was, his message in Tafki was to just be here. And we seem to let him be here. The government, everybody, nobody gave him a hard time. People knew he wasn't from around here. It didn't matter. Because there was something cosmic. Everybody that knew Ron knew there was just something a shtickle cosmic about him. Agreed? Just enough that you, even if you were against non-Jews or wanted them to convert, you kept it to yourself and you didn't make a fuss. Jews make a fuss. This was one case where nobody made a fuss. Every rabbi in town respected him, knew him. They came and prayed at his graveside. Okay? I mean, he was on the inner uh, workings of yeshivas. Nobody had a problem. Unison. Even people he had machlekes with. That was just machlekes of men. Nothing to do with him in terms of his background. And I wouldn't say everyone loved him. That's already, a fa uh, you know, what people say on the Hespit. Oh, he was the guttle, door and waiting. That's not what I'm saying. He was a man on a mission. He came on a mission. We respected the mission. We treated him according to the mission. And he brought out the mission in you. So when you met up with him, it wasn't about, hey, why are you here? He made you think, hey, why am I here? Everybody in town, he hit you on that little, little just enough. And maybe it was a self-defense. But at the same time, he was existential and in, in existential angst, and he made you enter existential angst. And it wasn't a good feeling 
fact, there were times it was pretty harsh. But at the end of the day, he made you figure stuff out. He made you figure it out. I don't, know, I, I don't think he was conscious. It's just this is what he did. Again, I think it was, it's his sole way of saying, leave me alone, I leave you alone. But on the spiritual level, it's, I'm here figuring it out, you got to figure it out too. And if, if you ask Ron, he'll just say he was a Gemini, and that's how Geminis are. And me being a Gemini around him, it was too too much alpha male. But I realize that's the Gemini me too. <laughs> it just, that's what it is. The book comes out. Nobody bothered Ron about it, but he was excited. He was excited. The book's going to be big, and he was supportive, excited, and we said we, we dedicated part of it to him. He was still having his meals at Chaim's house. And, you know, it just, it was Ron. People ask often, you know, was he a Jew? I say no. Some people say yes. In Ron's life, you look back. He was a Noahide with Fendel. He had spent a lot of time in Texas. He knew the whole Hevra. As, as Ron, as I said, used to say, he was a personal, close friend of, of Chaim Richmond. He's always said that. You say, this book, he had a book of the Third Temple. And you say, Chaim Richmond gave me this book personally. <laughs> Every time. And he gave himself a Hebrew name. You know, I do a shtickle work with names, so he had me do his name. He says, this is the name I've chosen. I want you to work it out. His name was David R. Solomon. And I don't know where he got it from, but that's just what he thought of. We had a lot of nights where we didn't sleep. Just talking the whole night about spiritual stuff. And the deeper we went in the night, the more powerful the Tikkun Chatzos got. Just resonating. Right, the, 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 I was afraid to live in that apartment after a while. It was so... So many talks and so, on so many levels. Remember the sheer we gave in there? Just like, it was scary. Because he, he had no limit, Ron. There were no limits to this guy. How far you want to go in your spirituality. He'll match you. He will match you. And I said some pretty radical things back in those days. And it scared the daylights out of me. What 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 would save my soul really was when I found out it wasn't it was, it was, it was, the things were true. That's what really got me. You know the things I told him from just a, a, an inclination, it just felt right. It was things about a non-Jew. But back then, before we knew this stuff, it's like, wow, David Katz, you better be sure about that. Every single thing came true. When you're in yeshiva, you don't realize how small it is. And there's a much bigger world. Telling Ron he had a soul. To me, that was like, whoa! Wow, you better be sure. The non-Jew is going to get you. Nowadays, in my work, it's like, I mean, that's, 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 that's elementary. It's an insult to say the opposite. We didn't know that back then. We knew it from here. Not from here. We've come, we've come a long way as a Noahide gear world the last six years. Agreed? A long way. Ron knew this in his heart. But there were no words and no way of articulating such a message. So he had to live in a society that he couldn't talk to about this straight. He found me and I could talk to him. I was scared to death. I'm saying things I don't know if it's right. That's why I've been so passionate in my work. Because in the very beginning, I met people like Ron and Ruby Wings and Tor of Shem, and it was so resoundingly true. I met people, you know, like Ross Bearden in the chat room and Ray Pedersen. Can we keep Shabbos? I look it up, and the gear keeps Shabbos. Seems to me you can. Then the opposition comes, and I'm saying, like, man, where? I hope I'm right. So it's been it's been a, a disciplined six years of proving that message is right. When you, when you get to this side of the fence, you look back and you realize there was never a chance it was wrong. 
Well, the question is, what was the Hava mean that you thought it wasn't right? That was the question people need to ask. But I didn't know that then. None of us did. Just shows you it's just an ironic life. The universal no eyed Torah is so... I understand your fears out there. Until you know, it is bloody scary. Right? But once you know and you look back, you say, mean, that was simple. What was the Havamina? But those talks with Ron was it just it, tremendous year of Shemayim coming down. Because it was serious. And Ron was serious. And he just wanted people to take him serious. I'm not talking from a mocking point of view. We're talking about on the soul. So he disappeared for a while from my consciousness just because, um, you know, Ron was a gear. Ron was good with Chaim. I saw him around town. We talked a little bit, but I moved on with my life and my kids, and Ron moved on, and we're all friends. So it was all good. Ron passed away. Was it last week? This week. Week before. The, oh, right, the end of last week. There was a, there was a, there was a Misa. They didn't know where they were going to bury him. That's why I got confused. Do you bury him in a righteous Gentile cemetery? Maybe next to Vendel by the Russians? Does he get a Jewish burial? Does he get a Noahide burial? Gare burial? Who even knows about this stuff? Who has money to bury him? He took sick for a while. We, they kept him alive for a very long time. He was unhealthy. He had bad habits of living, unfortunately. Diabetes and stuff. High blood, blood, blood sugar. And finally, life got the best of him. People wanted to save his life, but so there's so much you can do. So they, they, had, they had to wait until after Shabbos to figure out what to do with, with where he's going to be buried. That's when people started talking. The guy that did the bris thought he was a Jew. Because he, he doesn't he cannot conceive. A non-Jew who gets a bris and a, some kind of a dunk, how's that not a Jew? Everyone in the brother would think that's a Jew. So they went to Rav Shmuel Yahoo in town and they asked him if they can get a burial in Svan. Because they wanted him in town to be close. And I'm thinking to myself, if Rav Eliyahu gives him a Jewish burial, we got problems. There's the integrity of the Jewish people here. People say the problem with the message of Ger is conflating terms and conflating Jew and Gentile. Do you get more conflating Jew and Gentile than giving a Gentile a Jewish burial? And there's two guys in town that wrote the book the world of the gear, who have the answers to this question. Not only because we wrote the book, but because the book was written by the inspiration of the guy who died. Every sector of this points at Ron. It's not like I wrote a book about Ron and said, hey, Ron, I know about you, and now I'm going to tell you. No, Ron wrote the book for us. Ron died for us, so to speak. Right? He went to the Kaim's house a lot, he lived with me a lot. The book was written with his inspiration. And now someone's going to tell us he gets a Jewish burial. I don't think so. There is a, a certain level of responsibility of being a Jew. right? It's called doing the mitzvahs. That's why you convert to Judaism. You get the bris, you get the mikvah with the kavana, with the adam, with intention to fulfill mitzvot. Ron did not want to do that. That is on record as me saying that. I lived with him. I'm his friend. Spoke with him. Follow up friendship. All right. The guy was not interested in doing convert mitzvot. There's no way to say a Jewish burial. What is a Jewish burial? It's rabbinic in nature, I believe. I don't know exactly where it's rooted from, but it's one of those things that Jews just know to be Jewish about. The only one I can think of offhand is, how do you know the Jews don't proselytize? Because a Jew just knows that. It's a Jewish thing. You just don't do it. Right? We don't proselytize and we have restrictions and Jewish burial. This is one of those things. 
So they called the guy that did the bris, and he said he's Jewish. And then they played small head and said, okay, good enough for me. Bury him in the Jewish cemetery. So they did. And some people had issues. And some people didn't know enough to have issues. And the way it went down, okay, I understand. They wanted him close by. They didn't want to look into it. Uh, playing small head, a little bit of ignorance. Okay, whatever. What can you do? But I will say this. In my work, there are certain philosophical questions that people cannot understand with gear. Number one, is there conflating terms of Jew and Gentile? We've answered those questions. Gear strengthens the division, not the blurring of lines. Number two, does a non-Jew have a soul? The answer is yes, and you should be smacked in the head for asking that question. Number three, does the non-Jew get the world to come, i.e. a reward? Yes, and you should be smacked twice in the head for asking that question. It should be obvious to you. A lot of these types of questions have been asked, and we've answered them all. I'm not going into them in this recording. Go on YouTube and watch the 270 videos. Three slaps for asking that question. But one of the biggest questions that people ask, and it's not that I think it's a good question, it's just it's a better question than asking the stupid questions everyone else asks. Does a non a soul get a life? Is it better to convert and get the reward of a Jew and maybe be a bad Jew than to be a great gear Toshav non-Jew and not have the reward of a Jew? Under the premise that the reward of a Jew is better than that of a non-Jew. Now, I'm not so much going to take an elitist approach here, but I don't know if I have an opinion. I don't know if I let myself have an opinion. But there are those that think that the Jewish reward is a better spiritual reward than the non-Jew would receive. They base it on the Ramchal that they learn wrong. If you were to learn the wrong call right, you would understand why you learn it wrong. Which I'm also not getting into in the scope of this recording. I have a hard time believing that an Erev Rav, guilty of trespass convert, has a better reward than a totally Lushma, in love relationship with God, Ger Toshev. That's my opinion. Jethro didn't convert. Are you saying that these low-grade backyard conversions get a better reward than Jethro, who chose to not convert for the sake of upholding the Torah the highest level and sanctifying the gear of the Torah? Okay, that's a couple slaps in the head for those of you who asked that question. But Ron's not done. If Ron taught me about Shem in his cave, in the forgiveness, and talking nicely about the sages, and understanding the sages correctly, and Noah Hides, and Vendo Jones, and Rabbi Richman, and Chaim Chlorphine, and all these people in Texas, and just, Ron taught me everything about this. Everything. The confines of my home, how to prepare for a class at three in the morning. We called it boot camp. If I know anything about Kabbalah, I will tell you this. Ron was given a Jewish burial in Sfat. And that burial was given to a non-Jew. Not that it matters. And his soul has gone up to Shemayim. We know that to be a fact too, concurred? I don't really care what his soul was, if it was Jewish or non-Jewish. Because if you learn enough Kabbalah, you'll realize that's not a question. The Jews are garim on the land of Israel, okay? There's just so many conflated terms by the Torah itself. There's no question. Your job is to fix your meters, be a mensch, grow up, refine yourself, mature, do the mitzvahs you're supposed to do, and make Hashem happy. And God will judge you appropriately and you'll take your portion in the world of the, the world to come in the end of days. It's all you need to be concerned with. 
Most of the Jews that you're calling Jews anyways in the Tanakh are not Jewish. Why? Because at least half of the characters of Tanakh are some type of gear. All right? You know, maybe it's 70-30. Whatever ratio you want, it's not 100% Jewish. Look at the Rechabites and Jethro and Rachav, just for starters, along with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Adam, Noah, Shem. But in Kabbalah, there's something called Mayan Nukfin. When you sleep, your soul ascends with the daily learning and wisdom and code. When you, 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 you upload your data to the mainframe, the world of Atsilas. And whatever effect you have, you bring down the Shefa. That's how Kabbalah works. If I today learn the secret of whatever question somebody asks, I got it. David Katz figured it out. When I go to sleep, that answer ascends as my soul goes to the Mesifta de Rekia. And there will be a Shefa of Mayan Dukhrin, male waters coming down. This guy over here tomorrow will stand up and say, Ah, oh, I get it. That was simple. How did I never know this before? Because I answered it for you. So the Shefa came down. This story is prevalent in the Talmud and in the, the stories of rabbis. They labor 20 years on a question. And some layman over here gets it just in a snap of a finger. That's what we do. We unlock the heavens from our work down low. It's called this the Saruta de la Sata. To cause an awakening from below. To trigger response from heaven. That's how the redemption will come. That's how all Torah works. Everything is for down here. To bring down more Shefa down here. So that we can clarify, refine, and repair this world. When you sleep, this happens. When you die, it happens. That's why when the guttle of door dies... That's an aspect of Mashiach and Yosef dying. Why? It sends up the Mayan Nukvin. Right? Read the Arizal, the first two chapters of Itz Chaim. It's there explicit. The ten martyrs of Yom Kippur were this. Ron's soul definitely is Mayan Nukvin, just by definition of a man dying with a soul. And we can see in the Akharayim of his soul, what that soul mission was meant to do. Reveal the gear. Reveal all this stuff. Because he did it. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a book here. That he inspired personally and alone by himself. I lived it. I was there from the beginning. When he told me about Noah Hyde. Called up. Da, da, di, da, 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 the book. He's in there. Okay, the guy did it himself. Nobody helped him. It was in his soul. He couldn't not do it. In the Sfatis, they couldn't not give him a Jewish spirit. Ron was sent to unlock these mysteries. Maybe he was sent to help a guy in Idaho. I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, with what I've seen in Sfat, the guy, maybe he did 20 billion tikkunim. As far as I'm concerned, what, I, what is relevant to me, as if I matter here, but the point of discussion, the guy inspired a book, he inspired a movement, there's a worldwide gear movement, and I blame Ron Van Arsdale for that movement in the best way possible. Is his soul brought out of me, out of you, out of Chaim, out of everybody he knew. This is all that anyone ever figured out. Maybe I took it a little bit far to an extreme writing a book about it. All right? But we all got the same message. You and I have had many talks about Ron. It's the same message. What is a Gare? What is a Jew? What is a Noahide? That's what his message was. And when his soul reaches its place in Shemayim, wherever it may be, there's a question it's going to answer. Shemayim will ask him, Ron, are you a Jew or a non-Jew? And how I know they're going to ask him that. Because look where he's buried. If you learn the Torah of the Nefesh, of David and Melech, your Nefesh, as it enters the ground in the Kever, that's the power of the Mayan Nukfin that it sends up. We have a problem, Houston. There's a non-Jew right now in a Jewish cemetery. 
It is impossible, al pi Kabbalah, that that nefesh doesn't have what to answer for. It is being sent by definition. All right, if I walk into a bar with all people from Japan, they're going to say, why is an American in here? It's just the way it is. There's a non-Jew in a Jewish cemetery. And the question that there is going to be answered is, are you Jewish or are you not Jewish? You know what? The answer is he's buried in a Jewish cemetery. God is the true judge. God is merciful. Ron got his burial. Because the real answer is there's no such thing as a convert or a gear or a Jew when it gets down that level of its silas. A Jew's a gear in the land. A Bochuva, if you taunt him, he's a gear. Okay? A gear has mitzvahs. It's called ksat gerus. It's a type of conversion. A convert is just another type of gear, gear gamor. At the end of the day, we're all human Adam. The only question is, how much klippa do you have on your soul that prevents you from knowing what you are? Because an Akum gives Tuma just like a Jew does in death. With that said, with that said, this is my opinion. I don't know if it's absolutely true. And I don't wish to learn it right now. But it would seem to me that in the land of Israel, when a Ger Toshav is Chal, there's a Yovo and a Beis Hamikdash. And we live in our little group of, of Haredi Jews over here. And we had Ron, our Ger, Toshav slash Tzedek, non-Jew, and he dies. There's no reason to think that Ger wouldn't be buried in the Jewish burials. Maybe on the side like Venno Jones, where it's like the righteous non-Jew. I don't know. But it appears to me it wouldn't be in a Vera. It, would, it appears to me it wouldn't be so horrible. Now there's levels of Gertoshav. There are Gertoshav in your gate, and there's Gertoshav in your land. Ron was one in our land. You don't need a Gertoshav Yovel for that to happen, says the Rivet. Even today, and you see, we accepted him. And you see, we did the halacha, we did not do mitzvah l'chiyusa. If we would have done mitzvah the chayuso, the hospital would have been obligated to save his life. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. But the halacha gave that precedent, sadly to say. But this is all speculation, because we're not there. We don't have Garen dying in our midst. We don't know. Maybe I could open a book and find out. I just haven't had the need to do that yet. But again... The question is, or the answer is to the question, Ron got his burial. The case in point, he's there. What I do know is whatever Shemayim figures out with Ron's soul of where it ended up, where it was the intention it went in the ground, and where maybe it should have been, all P, whatever. If there's Mayan Nukfin or Choser Lehakadosh Baruchu, then there's an Or Yasher, a Mayan Dukhrin destined to come down of Shefa of Chokhmah. The Acharayim of Ron's ascension to his portion of the world to come. Alpi Kabbalah, it is definite that those answers, those existential answers to those questions that Ron in, in, in invoked in everybody he met will come down to this earth. Whatever questions are not answered in the book, in my teachings, in Chaim's teachings, whatever you figured out on your own, this is not my opinion once again. All P. Kabbalah what we know about Ron in his lifetime and how Kabbalah works when you die, more answers and Shefa are coming. The more we embrace the Ger on every level. Ger Gamor, who's a convert, is a Jew, a Ger Tzedek, non-Jew, Ger Taishev, Bismana Zeb, Bismana Ba, all these things, I can tell you and attest to you, Ron had a portion of every type of person in the spectrum. 
He's been uncircumcised. He's been circumcised. He's been Noahite. He's been Ger Toshav. He's been Ger Tzedek Nanju. He's now apparently Jewish in the cemetery with uh, free health care, says you. Right? And all these things, okay? He has lived every uh, spot of the operation. And the truth of what Ron was, I don't even know. I can say he was a Ger Toshav. I know he felt he was not Jewish. But what do you call a guy who doesn't have intention to be a Noahide? He rejected a vote of Zohar. He's not an Akum. He's not a geared Senate non-Jew because he doesn't do a certain mitzvot. He's not a Jewish convert. The answer is the guy had a heart of gold. God is merciful. God is the true judge. God will look in him and God will respond to the cries of that soul. Every soul cries out to God. God is merciful and hears the, the fawn crying out to God. We, I, can, I will say this, we took care of Ron. I know his soul is content. Okay, we're maybe not the best people on the planet, and Jews have to work on as much as anybody, but there are people in this town that loved him. We, we, we lived with him. He was among us. We accepted him. He accepted us. He died in the Holy Land. I can't, I can't only speak as much as, you know, only God, only God, Ron's heart knows what Ron's heart knows. All I can say is, hopefully we did you justice, Ron. We know that you did us more than we ever did you. And that you inspired more than you know. There's a world of gear in your merit. Alone. Nobody whispered the message in your ear. You whispered it into our ears. And it's my faith, based on truth of Kabbalah, that that whispering will continue to come down in the secrets of Kabbalah as per the rights of a soul that has lived this world and has Chachma to share above and deliver to us below. This is a dedication to the soul of David R. Solomon, Ron Van Arsdale, full resident of Sfat. May he be of blessed memory and a revelation of wisdom to all that knew him and that all that will continue to receive the wisdom in the merit of his soul. Amen.